Okay. Hello. Hello, everybody. And welcome to tonight's meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Um, so, first of all, we'll talk about um, apologies for absence and substitution. Have we got any apologies for absence, Alec? Just Councillor Murray. Okay. And we thought Councillor Elwood might be late. He's not with us just yet. Okay. I think everybody else is here. Um, so now we're going to approve as a, correct and true, as a correct record the minutes of the meeting held on the 6th of September. Has anybody got any comments on the minutes of the meeting? No? Is that okay with everybody? Okay, great. That's... You, you're moving a Marge. Any second? Anybody second in the minutes? Yep. All in Are you all in favour? Yep. Okay. Great. Okay, we'll move on to the next thing. Any declarations of interest amongst you on, about things on tonight's agenda? Councillor Rachel Ellis. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I wish to declare I have a, a personal co connection with one of the uh, speakers today. Okay, great. Thank Thanks, Rachel. Um, okay, so... With that in mind, we're going to move on to item four, which is the uh, our program of portfolio holder attendances. Tonight, we've got Councillor David Ellis with us, who's the um, portfolio holder for public protection. Um, and um, he's, I believe he's got a presentation to show us. So uh, over to you, David. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll see if I can work Kate's, uh, Kate's laptop. Uh, uh, this is the, uh, you, you've seen this before, this is the, um, uh, my, uh, the, my portfolio, the different aspects of the portfolio. Um, I'm going to talk, the presentation's really in two parts. There's one, it's an overview of the portfolio and, uh, and updates and developments, um, areas that I think you would be interested in and, and the areas that you've already expressed your interest in, uh, and questions you've raised. And then there's the uh, review of the South Norwich Community Safety Partnership, which is a... a, a a statutory re requirement. Uh, now, the areas I want to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about crime and social behaviour. You asked for a, a, an overview or an update on, on crime uh, statistics. Uh, you, asked, you asked to talk about uh, CCTV, um, particularly about issues about what we're allowed to use it for, what we're not allowed to use it for. Um, and and uh, I want to talk about housing grants and food safety and standards, which you've not, uh, uh, you thought you might be interested in, and you, you asked about safeguarding. At this point, can I, can I introduce Kevin Nealon, who's the uh, community safety manager, who a lot of you will know anyway, um, and apologies from Sam Palmer, who's the food, health and housing manager. Uh, unfortunately, he's ill. So if there's any questions on his, his areas of expertise, then uh, we'll have to take them, take them away. So, you asked what's happened to crime. This is the um, crime. These, this is all the crime statistics in in 2021. So it's crime as of March this year, um, taken from the PCC's annual annual report. And we, when we uh, when we met last year, we talked about what happened to crime and what happened to antisocial behaviour, and very much this this. Re this reflects that, um, that crime is down significantly, um, primarily because the opportunities for, for crime uh, diminished. You know, people were at home, uh, weren't about, so there was less opportunity for the, the robberies of vehicle offences and burglary. Um, and you'll see the, the uh, difference there, the, the, uh, the, one, the third one up, online crime, which did show an increase um, as people, as, as, as uh, perpetrators weren't attempting crime, other sorts of crime, the level of, of, of online crime increased significantly. And you'll see the, the last one at the bottom, the antisocial behaviour incidents, 50% uh, increase in that. And as we talked about last year, um, that's largely a, a consequence of the reporting that... Uh, um, anything to do with COVID, 
with people not wearing masks, with, that, with sort of uh, complaints about uh, uh, that sort of behaviour was, was, was counted as, 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 as ASB. Um, and there were lots of increasing ASB complaints because people were at home more and complaining more about their neighbours being noisy, complaining about more than six people uh, going round to the neighbours and, and stuff like that. So, in many ways, 20, 2020, 2021 was a very strange year, as we, as we know, and, and for crime statistics, is, is, is very unreliable. But I'm interested, you might be interested in the uh, domestic abuse crime figures which actually showed uh, a reported uh, a decline in, in reported domestic abuse. Now, that was something we were certainly concerned about. The police locally were proactive uh, in visiting uh, previous victims. Um, they, they, they have a procedure where the, the public protection team uh, visits the, the high-risk individuals, but the, the, the neighbourhood team uh, were actually going out and visiting the medium-risk uh, individuals to give them reassurance um, and you, you know from the work you did as a as a, a working group on domestic violence that the sanctuary scheme uh, was was quite effective last year uh, we, we spent a lot more on on if you like target hardening um, for, for victims this is taken from the uh, annual police and crime um, status report that the, uh, the office and the PCC uh, produce, which tries to uh, show you how... Dave, Mike... Sorry, Dave, I was going to say, Dave, Mike's got his hand up. Do you want to take questions now or do you want to take... So, sorry, yeah. can, can, can I just ask oh, a question on. On, on, on the previous sheet? Because I'm never sure quite what I'm looking at, but are they... <clears throat> um, crimes that have been reported or are they crimes that the police have looked into? Uh, it's reported crimes. Yeah, so, so because I, I seem to recall somebody saying the ASB incidents were massively up because any, any report of somebody not wearing a mask or complaint was, was taken down as a, an ASB. Yes. Um, it, would, it would help actually if the police had thought on and actually said, well, we'll record them under a separate heading because to say ASB incidents are up 50% is, well, it's a bit misleading, I think. You're opening, trying to open a whole can of worms there about police recording standards. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion nationally about police recording standards and some forces that... Uh, the the, the uh, HMIC inspects forces and one of the things they look at is recording practices and they, they're certainly very clear that lots of forces had got uh, ineffective recording practices so they were understating the level of, of crime. Um, I suppose in retrospect it would have been good if they'd, if they'd had time uh, to address this in COVID but I think there's a lot of things that uh, in retrospect if we'd have known COVID was coming we'd have done differently. Yeah, but I say it's 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 home office standards. It's not it's not something that the uh, the local police can can do anything about. Mm. We've got Paul Feeney wanted to ask something. And also, I want to just yeah. add that um, Councillor Elwood has joined the meeting as well now. Um, so Paul, and then I think Marge wants to was indicating as well. Paul. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just could you elaborate, Dave, on the online crime? Obviously, we're dealing with Gedlin's um, crime figures, but online crime is national, if not international. Could you actually uh, explain really what type of events or uh, incidents they are? There will be more of this later on, but yes, you, you, you're quite right. Most, most of it, well, we've probably all been victims or have attempted uh, online crime, um, whether it's uh, an, an email uh, telling you you've, you've, you've won something or the Colonel's widow from Nigeria uh, saying if you, you can help her get some money out of uh, Nigeria, you can have a share of it. So there's all there's all that uh, that sort of thing. Much of which is is international. The whole range of, of scams. I think we've we've all um, been. I'm sure we've all been. People have tried to scam us. We've 
you know, I don't know about you, but I get two or three emails a day that go into, into my junk that are people telling me I've, I've won this, I've won something on, on bitcoins or, or something like that. Me. Um, going back to the ASB, uh, presumably the police could drill down, if it, but there's so many variants of ASB that we would look then at a, a whole half hour of ASB type incidents, which wouldn't be any more helpful for us. Um, but uh, um, presumably they use the ASB different categories to decide their actions in different areas. Thank you. Yes, that's quite right. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't see you there, Councillor Boyle, with the hand up. Thank you, Ch Thank you Chair. Just a, a quick question as a follow-up on, on some of that. Presumably the online crime is where the victim is actually within in the borough, no matter where it emanates from. So that's the first question. And then the other question I have is where you've got things like online crime, possibly de domestic abuse, possibly other things, um, there might be a crossover between the categories, and how is that dealt with? Are they counted twice, or are they, are they pushed into one category or another? Uh, it's, no, it's, it, it's, it's recorded in one category. They, 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 don't, they wouldn't want to double count things. Um, and this, these, these, crime, these, these figures are crime in Nottinghamshire. So yes, you're right, it's the victim in Nottinghamshire. Carry on, David. Okay. So, as I say, this, this is an attempt to identify the effect of COVID on, on recorded crime. Say, so last year, it's a strange year, so it's, it's, it's difficult to draw any conclusions from that. But you can see there, the, 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 the solid blue line is crime, is police recorded crime, a victim-based victim crime. Um, and you'll see up until March 2020, it was, it was going on at a level. Then uh, in, in, in April, it, it dropped significantly. And as things have gradually got back to normal, it sort of edged up. Then when we had another lockdown, it went back down again. And then um, it's back up, up, up to not quite the level that we would normally have expected. The dotted line is the uh, projection from the, the police of where crime would have gone, and the uh, the blue shading is sort of upper and lower lower bounds. So you, you, see, you can see that even now, the level of recorded crime is less than than would have been anticipated without COVID. And this is trying to 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 unpick that even even further. We've talked in previous years about the distinction between police recorded crime and the, um, the, the, the uh, crime survey for, for England, England and Wales. And if you remember, recorded crime, as we said, is crime recorded by the police. The survey for, for England and Wales tries to capture people's experience of crime uh, and is, is consistently, the, the survey is consistently higher than recorded crime, which is Understandable, I think. You know, we I think we all be aware of of crimes that um, are not um, have not been recorded. So you see, the blocks at the bottom are recorded crime, and you'll, you'll see the the dark blue shows the actual recorded crime, and the light blue blocks are the estimate if uh, COVID hadn't uh, hadn't applied. So um, you, you'll see that on, on the 2020 and 2021 uh, blocks, there's a, a, a small light block at the top, which tries to bring the, the total crimes to, what, to where the, uh, um, the, the police force thing would have happened if it had not been for, for COVID. Then the line, the line above that is the estimated level of crime uh, from the from the ONS, well, so it, oh, because of COVID, the ONS weren't able to do the survey in the same way this this year. 
so, so these, this was a local survey, uh, the, the, the Nottinghamshire Police and Crime Commissioner's survey shows a similar p picture, um, but it's, we thought, they thought it was more reliable this year than the, the ONS, uh, the, the crime survey for England and Wales. So trying to unpick, unpick those a little bit more. So the, the, the first blue line up is the estimated crime from the survey, uh, excluding online fraud and, um, and cyber crime. So you'll see it's, it's, it's consistently higher than the recorded crime um, and, and so more or less on, on, on a level. The red line is the, is the survey's estimate of crime, including online for, fraud and crime, that uh, <coughs> um, actually <coughs> happened. So where people were conned into, uh, into responding to a, to a scam or, or whatever, and, and lost, lost money or whatever, that's recorded in, the, in those figures. So you'll see that it's something like 376 thousand crimes uh, is the estimate compared to the uh, in 2021 compared to the recorded crime of 92,000 so you see the scale of, of difference then the top line the the, the what was it a light gray line includes the uh, estimated crime including online fraud and cyber crime including attempts of course, in, in, all, in all of these, the dotted line are, 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 are projections and predictions. So you can see how attempts have been consistently higher uh, than, than actual crimes, which is good. But you can also see how the, the attempts are, uh, are going up significantly. So that's, that's all very much the uh, Nottinghamshire wide and trying to bring it down to, uh, to Gedling, to the, to the borough. And again, because 2020 figures are unreliable, I've included here the 2019 figures. So you can see a breakdown of crime in, in, the, uh, in the borough. You see the year to date to the end of October 2021 compared to the same period in 2020 and 2019. So that's basically six or seven months from, from April to, to October. And you can see there, the compared to 2020, there's been an increase in, in crime as, as, for want of a better expression, things get back to normal. So th 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 things are normal, so you see slight increase in all crime, slight increase in victim-based crime, slight increase in uh, violence against the person, um, theft, um, shoplifting, I mean, there's a fairly significant increase in shoplifting, lofted, shoplifting which you couldn't understand as, as, as shops are now, are now open. But again, because of the, uh, the uh, risk of, uh, of last year being a false year, if you look at the 2019 figures, so that compares 2019 to 2021, and you can see considerably more green figures there, which shows that there's been a continued reduction in compared to 2019, um, with a couple of areas where there's been uh, an increase. And you'll see there's been an increase uh, in compared to 2019 um, in drugs, in drug offences, partly because the, the police were, were very proactive during lockdown. Um, could say nothing better to do, but no, they were they, they were very proactive uh, in in tackling the drug offences, and we've all we've all seen stuff that uh, uh, the Reacher team was doing, uh, knocking doors down and, and uh, sorting sorting drug uh, drug offences out. Mm. Do you want to come out, Jim? Got a question? Yeah. Yeah. So just for clarification, that I, I know the Reacher team, I've seen them in act, they're very good, so it's bound to go up in that. But are the figures just actually sellers, or is it mixed with users? Because it just says drugs. So is, it, uh, is there a mix in there that the police will know that we don't? I, th I think that's, that's primarily possession. 
offences. The, the, the police are, uh, sorry, supply offences. The police are, are relatively light on, on low level possession. Uh, but lots of possession that could be, uh, could be dealing or obvious dealing, uh, they're, 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 they're more involved, more interested in. Um, And then coming down, coming down even, even further, this is a, a trend uh, comparison just to see how the South Knots Community Safety Partnership, which is Broxdale, Gedling and Rushcliffe, compares to, to Mansfield and Ashfield um, and the uh, Bassalow, Newark and, and Sherwood. And you can see similar sorts of, of, of figures for 2021. Again, that was until March 2021. Uh, reductions in all crime, and everybody had a, a similar sort of increase in, in uh, antisocial behaviour. And then bre breaking the South North CSP stuff down for the year to date. So there you, again, you can see re reverting to normal, fairly similar across the, uh, across the piece, um, and, and ASB a reduction back to the, back to the norm for the reasons that uh, uh, we've, we've, we've talked about with COVID being less of a, an issue. Councillor Paling has got a question. Just a quick question. Um, do the police understand why Rushcliffe seems to have more victim-based crime compared to us at the moment or at that point in time? Well, no, they haven't. They haven't got more victim crimes. They've got low. They've got low. They've got lower, but they're catching up with us. Yes. So no, no. The police don't know why that is, but the local neighbourhood inspector is, is quite happy to see it go in that direction. <laughs> so as as you know, we we work closely with the the the, the local police um, in in setting policing priorities because I I write round I. I think it's a quarterly meeting, and I write round to, to members asking for uh, for any, any information you want to feed in into into that. Um, and thanks for those those who do who do respond to 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 that. Um, so that's the combination of the police's local intelligence; they know what's going on. Um, what we feed in as members, and and and, and, the, and the statistics. So you'll see there the, the three priorities that have been agreed between October and, and December, drugs, residential burglary, uh, and, and ASB. So although drug supply is, is categorized as a, as a crime against society, you know, because there's, there's, there's no direct victim, um, it's obviously linked with other crimes, uh, linked with property crimes, with, with shoplifting, and it leads to, to antisocial behavior, it causes alarm and harassment or distress to people and uh, uh, it's linked with, with violence and much of the, of the knife crime that we see is between people who are engaged in organised organised crime. Um, the local priorities is very much on building intelligence and enforcement activities on uh, dismantling county lines. I would just, one thing I would, I would say is, is members come, often come to me with uh, concerns about drugs, about drug, drug behaviour behavior in, in, the, in the local area, and that's all, all useful, that sort of useful intelligence. If anybody comes to you, tell them to, to report it to, uh, to, to uh, Crime Stoppers 101. Um, even though nothing may happen directly as a result of that, obviously the intelligence provides a, a picture over, over time. In terms of what the police are doing, or generally as a partnership on, on drug supply, um, the police approach will be about more schools officers and providing education and proactive police, policing. We talk about Operation Reacher, uh, who can serve warrants and, and disrupt supply and a significant seizure of drugs and weapons cash. And the inf less information I, I, I had was that uh, there were 62 magistrates court warrants have been have been served last year 167 drug seizures 275 thousand pounds in in cash seized and 92 weapons taken off the streets as, as part of this 
Second priority, residential burglary, which of course is one of the most invasive uh, crimes. As I said earlier, because of lockdown last year, it was quiet. Um, and there's been a reduction. I think we're concerned that not to lose the, the momentum. And this is a, a particular issue at uh, the present, in the next few months with, with Christmas presents. And there's, there's always a, a risk of Christmas, Christmas uh, um, presents providing too much of a temptation. And the, the issue with, with uh, residential burglary, as much as anything, is people seem to be getting very, very, uh, very slack with a lot of this. I mean, there's there's, there's uh, um, the basics, the basics of securing, uh, securing houses, securing securing cars, seems to have, uh, have drifted a little bit. So that we were putting campaigns on on to people to hide stuff in in cars and to make sure the, the uh, they're locked. Um, talked about ASB in, in COVID, but uh, there's a, we're concerned that is, once you strip out the COVID effect, there's still a significant uh, underlying concerns. And we've had recent issues in Arnold Town Centre, um, including alcohol-related issues that are damaging the night, nighttime economies. We're trying to bring the uh, town centres back into, into life. Um, so the, the, the police are very much increasing patrols here, we've got using dispersal orders where that's that's appropriate. Uh, we have the CCTV active in, in the in terms of the, the nighttime economy to um, to address to address that. Um, and uh, we're looking to see whether public sector public space protection orders would be would be appropriate. Had a meeting in in February with the some of the Conservatives members to talk about uh, ASB and I've fed back to you that there's been a, uh, a, police, a step up in police uh, patrols and warden patrols, places place like Ravenshead and, and engaged with uh, with young people. And I know Martin recognised that that has had some effect, some positive effect on them. Do you want to comment on that, Councillor Smith? Yeah, Martin. Yeah, thank you, uh, David. Um, the, the, the misconception, I think, for most of the public is, and particularly if you read the, the articles in Nottingham Live and Gedling Eye, is that we don't see bobbies on the beat. Um, my, my experience is, is far from that. Um, I, I know there's been a, a few extra policemen provided to the area, and, and that isn't a political point, it's a fact. Uh, but those people, are, those people are being seen. Uh, and I think it's certainly in my ward, it's made a huge difference. Uh, and I think I've mentioned before, my, my only plea, and I've said this to Chris Pearson, if only they would get out of their cars. They do occasionally. The people that do a lot of the patrolling are our own neighbourhood wardens who are very good at getting out and engaging, particularly with young people, um, to, to prevent the small scale, the low, the low level antisocial behaviour. The police, again, they, they do tend to stay in the cars and there may well be good reasons. They're filling in forms, they're reading things on the, the, their iP the laptops, but... Uh, just get out and, and be seen. But they are, they are seen in their vehicles, and certainly in my patch, I'm, I'm no doubt in other, other areas, they've, they've recently done a patchwork, you know, um, to, meet, to meet residents, and that's certainly gone down very, very well. Just a little bit more of it, but on the whole, you know, I, th I think we do give Chris Pearson the praise that I think he deserves, and uh, I think we need to continue doing that and, and work with the police, um, but we certainly seem to be doing at the moment. Okay, I think Sam Smith, you're indicating too. Yeah, thank you. Just to thank you, David, actually, because um, you did meet with the Conservative group and um, you followed that up just recently, actually, a few weeks ago as well. So we didn't just have one meeting. You've actually followed that up over the course of a few months and it has had an impact. The wardens are really busy in Stoke Bardolph. We've got fly tipping problems, as you know, constantly. And they get out their van, they engage with the fishermen who are now doing litter picks for us. And, and, and um, it's the same officer all the time I, I see her. Uh, every week and uh, you know she's driving up and down in the van and getting out and engaging with people and I think it's just being seen um, is half the problem um, but they do do a great job it's a shame that uh, you know the conviction rate of fly tipping isn't as good as it should be but that's because the evidence isn't always there but you did engage with us the action on the ground is really good um, so thanks to you and the team well, thank you thank you for that yes it's the wardens are very good at getting out and, 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 and seeing people. Seeing about, uh, and funnily enough, I, I find it strange that uh, the Operation Reacher teams are, are very good. 
that, you, know, you, you, you see them most of the time, and they're um, police officers who spend a lot of their time smashing doors down and breaking into things. And then the next thing, they're, they're in the middle of Arnold or, 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 or Calver they've been in Calverton, chatting to people and get, getting the intelligence. I, that's, it's, it's, it's a surprising model, but it, it does seem to work. Okay. Yep, carry on, David. Right, CCTV. You asked what, what's it allowed to be used for? What can more additional cameras do and how, how has COVID, COVID changed things? This is an area where, where we've got to strike a balance and we're regulated by the 2013 Code of Practice, which does try, try to strike this balance between protecting the public and civil liberties. And there's obviously a line to, to tread there um, that, that uh, CCTV's the front front end. I mean, I think you can you can remember those who remember the the last uh, Labour government was very hot on surveillance, uh, it was sort of encouraging surveillance. And when the uh, 2010 government came in, they 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 very much swung the swung the other way, um, and we've we've had uh, quite a lot of restrictions on on our on our uh, our powers. Uh, for instance, on uh, covert, covert surveillance. Uh, we can only apply that if it's um, uh, something which could result in a six-month sentence, which is quite a high tariff for, uh, um, for, for, for covert surveillance. So we report regularly, uh, annual report to, to, uh, to Cabinet, and the, uh, I get re quarterly reports, and it's not on, on covert surveillance. It's normally there hasn't been any. It's, such, it's a high, it's a high, high barrier to to, to cross. Um, the, we're regulated by the uh, the Protection of Freedom Act 2012 and the Regulation Investigative Powers Act 2000, and we have uh, uh, we have duties have regard to the to the code of, of practice which the uh, the minister issued. And in brief, brief, the use of surveillance has to be in pursuit of a legitimate aim, necessary to meet a, a pressing need, proportionate, effective, and compliant with any, any legal obligations. Uh, we've, we've built different systems that have been built up over, over time, which I think is part of why the code of practice uh, is, to try, is trying to pull, pull this all, all together. So I imagine that you're, you're, when you think about CCTV, you're thinking about the, the public space CCTV we have. But we've also got CCTV around civic buildings, leisure centres, in our vehicles. We've now got staff with body-worn videos. Um, so we need to, to pull this together and have some sort of consistency and compliance. And Kevin has been nominated as our SPOC, a single point of contact across all the, all the CCTV systems, systems we, we have. Um, and we all know that there's been an increasing amount of surveillance, the number of private individuals who've, who've got uh, CCTV, um, the amount of stuff you see on, on news broadcasts and on, on Twitter and thing, things like that, um, and people with uh, CCTV in their, in their dash cams and whatever in their, in their vehicles. Uh, we've got highways, of course, we've got uh, uh, CCTV for their to control the, uh, the roads. And the police have got uh, the uh, uh, automatic police, automatic number recognition. Okay, so, so we are, got, we have got a lot of surveillance on us as, as individuals. And they say this is this is where there's a, there's a balance to be to be struck. We've invested in, in 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 CCTV. Many of our older cameras have now been replaced with the new digital cameras, which give a far better uh, quality images. We've had new cameras installed in, in hotspots that justify them. So we've got places like, uh, I know there's one in Calverton that we opened fairly well, a few years ago now. Uh, Rolston Drive, Kettling uh, Country Park, Car Park, Conway Road Recreation Ground, and we're looking at, uh, at uh, Carlton Square with the new car park, car park there. There's a lot of discussion about when and CCTV is, is effective. And I think we've got a record of some successful prosecutions uh, and criminal damage in, in some of our parks we've responded to. Uh, 
shoplifters have been been tracked down going going down down the streets. They do seem to be particularly effective in in, in car park in car parks. In terms of what could additional cameras do, m well, more surveillance. There's, but there's a point at which you say, uh, how mo how many how many cameras can a, can a, an individual in the control room control room monitor? But we do take it seriously. We do comply with the with the law and where. Uh, cameras are proportionate and necessary. We will uh, we will look to uh, introduce them. Well, question from Councillor. Uh, well, Sam Smith and Martin Smith. I don't know who was first. Go on, Sam. Thank you. Just on cameras. Um, thanks to Gedlin actually for working with Chris Pearson and I and Councillor Adams getting a number plate recognition camera installed on Nottingham Road, which is great news through some PCC funding. Um, when I've been talking to Chris about that, he mentioned that Ashfield and Mansfield are getting a quite heavy investment in cameras, but Gedling is a bit behind on the funding. And is there any pressure you, as our representative to the PCC, can put on them to get some money in Gedling for new camera locations? Because you mentioned that Ashford, I can't remember the figure, but Ashford and Mansfield are heavily invested in compared to Gedling. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the police, the PCC only funds AMPR cameras, doesn't fund the, 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 the normal cameras. But no, we have got more uh, AMPC, AMPR cameras coming in. Um, we, we had a meeting with him a couple of weeks ago, and he was, he was, he was quite happy with the... the, the, the He's quite optimistic that some additional cameras come in, come in there, particularly um, to serve uh, to serve Burton Joyce and, and people come in from from uh, Lincolnshire. So he was he was he was quite. I mean, if he if he feels there's a need for more pressure, then we will put pressure on. At this point, he's telling us it's 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 going it's going the way we want it to go. Okay, Martin. Uh, yeah, and this this question may actually go towards uh, to go, be directed towards Kevin. Um, Again, rather a personal question, really. Um, Ravenshead uh, has one camera at Ravenshead Leisure Centre that's uh, funded by Gedling. And uh, David talked earlier about the, the regulations and the red tape trying to access images. Uh, and as a result, we, the Paris Council used its SIL money uh, to install 13 of its own cameras because we find it easier to, to access the information uh, and do something about uh, incidents that occur. However, I'd, like, I'd be interested to know whether that camera of Gedlings is, is still active um, because th either the operator's never seen anything or, or he's not told us about an incident. And certainly the Ravenshead Prize Council would, would like feedback on, on how effective it is. Um, I don't okay. know if you can answer that, uh, Kevin. I'm hoping you can hear me. Yep. Not used this before. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, well, there's four cameras which are installed in the leisure centre which transmit images back to the control room at Jubilee House. Um, I think they were put in a number of years ago and funded by the parish council. So there was a conversation with Councillor Barnfather. Um, they were looking to um, in install a system and I think they were gonna to look to record it locally and they were encouraged by the local police to try and get that to a monitored room. Um, and, and we did that back at the, um, back at the, the uh, Jubilee control room. Um, I think there is always, um, frustration with people where CCTV is um, used to, to deal with crime um, because the difficulty with, with the cameras is uh, they either might be viewing a different area or they may not get a whole situation or I know that that, that area has developed now and I, I think some of the play areas, the skateboard parks are probably a bit away from the original cameras. Um, there have been positive stories from the four cameras that we've we've been installed i think they were involved in reporting some car crime i think they've been um, assisted in reporting a, a break-in i think the police have used them to uh, target a burglar who was um, uh, passing by uh, and was carrying some stolen goods um, they to be fair they're not the most viewed cameras because of the location so the back of a, a leisure centre on a pathway is not going to be as actively monitored as, a, as the retail parks you know the, the pubs the nighttime economy so it is really a balance um, I have been to the leisure centre uh, sorry I've been to the parish council uh, and I've offered support I've, I've um, actually had some of the parish council come down to the control room where we've got it I'm 
I'm quite, I'm quite happy to do that. I know that members sometimes do get a bit of interest getting in, into the control room and having a look. And now that COVID's um, not gone, but, but, but you know, things were loosened up a little bit, I could, I could arrange that if it will, it will offer reassurance. Um, we continue to work with the parish council. I think we've assisted in the lighting and it was the company that we used which also installed those 13 extra cameras. Um, there's no way that Gedlin would have been able to fund 13 cameras around the leisure centre. So that, you know, we just have not got the resources to do that. You know, there are some town centres like Netherfield that have barely got 13. So it was a big investment that you chose to do and was, you know, fair enough and it, and it will help the police. A lot of, lots of the issues we get with CCTV is not from the operators. The images may be there, but either the crimes are not recorded, and I'm not just talking about the leisure centre, I'm talking about generally. The crimes might not be recorded or they might not be accessed by the police. There's been some issues with that. Um, but the offer goes out to, you know, if, if you think that those links do need building up, then we can take that on board. And, you know, if you want to sort of have a dialogue afterwards, I'm quite happy to do that, councillors. Yeah, Th thank you, Kevin. It's, yeah. okay, it's reassuring just to actually know that those, those cameras of Gedlings are working. Yeah, and, yes, um, they, yes. And they have, they have been useful. Yeah. Um, so you, you probably can't give us feedback on, on, on specific issues when, when and if they occur because of of all these regulations but, but if they're working that's fine and the, the four that the f things to think yeah. of positive things that have come from it but i do i do recall the yeah and the 13 that the paris council own again the, the working in tandem um you know i th thought i think they do have that they have had some effect and uh, and i've mentioned to david before you know i think the police have been very good and they've been quite proportionate in their response mm. particularly with young people uh, it, it's not always it's not always a, a conviction that's required. It's actually a knock on the door, uh, and, and the team at the moment are, are very good at knocking on the door and just and, and just telling the, the young person off in front of parents, um, and, and that's that's really a, a great effect of the cameras. We can actually spot these people, and perhaps with a little bit of local knowledge, unlike the the people in the bunker because I was one of those people came to have a look at a few years ago, and it is a bit of a bunker. Uh, um, they they don't know them by name, do they? Um, but again, we'll we'll talk after the meeting. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Creamer. Yes, thank you. It's just just an issue that's been brought up. I can understand where certain incidents have been missed, but once they're reported, you can go back to the tapes, and that's the question: How long are the actual recordings kept for before they're deleted? So the recordings are kept for twenty eight days. So we've got seventy eight cameras. Um, the images are recorded at anything between sort of 16 and 10 frames per second. If you think about your television, that's at sort of 25 frames per second. So they're good, they're good quality, you know, they, they appear to be people moving around. It's not that stilted walk that you used to have on, on Crime Watch 20 years ago. Um, and uh, in accordance with the um, Surveillance Commissioner's recommendations, they're kept for 28 days. Sometimes more, we've known to be able to get them from 31 days. So we do, we do get them. And you're quite right as well. Um, you know, the cameras are all strategically placed to view areas where potential crime could happen. So whilst an operator is not using the camera, i.e. directing the camera, um, there have been more successful incidents where the police have come in, I wouldn't say on a fishing incident, but they'll say, you know, there's been an assault outside a particular pub. We do know there's a camera there. Can you have a look? Because the assault was reported at 11 o'clock at night. Hey, presto, there it is. It could be because we have 68 hours of operate, 68 hours a week where operators are in the control room. You know, that's, there's a vast proportion of time when nobody's in there, but the cameras are recording. So the cameras record 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and all images are held for, you know, to a potential of 31, but definitely 28 days. Okay. Come around, David. Thank you. While, while uh, Kevin was talking, just reminding me that uh, those of you who are on e and l will be aware that uh, we're consulting on the taxi standards. And one of the issues there is whether we have uh, uh, whether we require them to have a, a CCTV in in the taxis. I don't know where that's going to come, but it'll be an interesting issue. Excuse me. If we move on to um, South North CSP, you've seen this slide before. It's the structure of the South the uh, Community Safety Partnership. 
you'll, you, you, you'll be aware that uh, uh, every local authority at one point was required to have a community safety partnership and then the, 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 the law was changed and um, we were able to, to merge them and we merged the South Nottinghamshire one. So that's the covers, say covers, Gedling, Rushcliffe and Broxstow. And that's, that's a meeting where you get uh, members, I go to that meeting, um, members from other, the other authorities do. You get uh, senior uh, directors and uh, senior police officers and representatives of other, other agencies. It's chaired by the, the chief executive of uh, Broxstow Borough, Borough Council. The main driving uh, force behind it, or driving place, is the operational delivery group, where those who are more involved in the day-to-day -day basis actually share in information and, uh, and and coordinate things. It's, it's useful as a as a means for uh, um, sharing out uh, PCC grants and, and other sources of funding. And then below that, each each authority has a local operations group, um, and we have we have a really close relationship with the the police, although as well as have the neighbour teams, as well as having the, the local meetings. Uh, the, there's the you know, uh, coffee coffee uh, meetings over coffee, and, and some of that is very very close relationship at Jubilee House. The only drawback to that is that uh, since the police moved in, the biscuits seem to disappear. And then below that, there's the uh, the the complex needs panel, which meets monthly, um, includes, uh, it's chaired by, up to now, recently it's been chaired by, by David Jane. It includes the police, um, a public protection team, Gedling Homes, Youth Offending Service, Family Service, and Social Care Mental Health. And this is case management of, of antisocial behaviour of, of, of individual groups with, uh, with complex, uh, complex needs. I thought it might, it might be interested to see the priorities that uh, the Safe and Knots Board, so as well as the uh, district level uh, uh, community safety partnerships, there's the Safe and Knots Board that's chaired by the, uh, the Chief Executive of the, of the County Council and attended by uh, Chief Executives of all the, all the district councils. And uh, that's their, their, their 11, 11 priorities, as you can see. Is, uh, Quite a, quite a wide-ranging uh, set of, of, of priorities. Um, Mike Hill is the elite leads on modern slavery. Uh, he inherited that from, from John Robinson. John Robinson took, him, took it with him when he went to Newark and has now passed it back to, to Mike Hill. Um, so, so you can see the sort of areas that they're, they're working on as a, as a, as a partnership. One of the things is, is, the, is, the achieve, is the achievements of the South North CSP. Um, I think one of the achievements for many services over the last, last year is it's kept going. It's continued, it's met virtually. Um, and there's been a lot of sharing experiences and uh, I say it's distributed PCC funding. In the early days of, of, of CSPs, uh, there, there were direct grants to them, which of course made them very attractive to, uh, to partners. There's less less grants now, so uh, there's more of a risk that partners will uh, um, vote, with their, vote with their feet. But the fact that they, they continue to meet and continue to share experiences is, is a good, is, is a good uh, position to be in. So that's, if you like, that's crime in, in, in its sort of widest senses. So I'll move on to the, uh, an area that I thought doesn't get a lot of coverage, but I thought you might be, be interested in. And that's the work that uh, uh, Sam Palmer's team does in terms of improving housing conditions. We've talked previously, I think last, last year, we talked about, uh, safe, about uh, selective licensing. But these are, these are a couple of other areas you might be interested in. It's a very complicated area, and I don't pretend to be able to, to understand it. Um, so I've, I've, I've actually broken it down into two areas. It's, 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 it's where the resources come from. The first area is the Better Care Fund, um, which is, is a, a fund which 
is, to, is, is it to provide essential adaptations to make it possible for disabled people to remain living at home or to, to ensure they're, they're cared for safe, safely. And that's things like improving access to the, to the property, insulation of light, suitable lighting, heating and ven ventilation, and giving people the opportunity to access facilities. There's a, the Dis Disabled Facilities Grant, which is there's a mandatory grant um, of up to 30,000. Um, and then there's discretionary grants, which are either used top up the man mandatory grant or where people uh, fall foul of some of the means tested areas. Um, and that, that the capital budget there is something in the region of a million pounds a year, which is quite, a, for, for, for an authority our size, is quite a substantial uh, amount of, of money to put into uh, uh, private sector homes to, to make a difference to, to people. Um, there are various v variations on that. The warm homes on, on prescription is uh, uh, discretionary grants to relieve uh, medical conditions for people on low, low incomes. So we talk about things like uh, boilers, where they haven't got boilers or, or things like that. Although quite where, what's the, where that's going to go with the uh, warm, the, 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 earth, the, the new pumps thing, I'm not sure. The second area of funding is the energy com company obligation. You'll be aware that uh, energy suppliers are respons responsible for assisting with energy efficiency and, and fuel fuel poverty in eligible um, households. So this is a, a number of schemes that come and go, uh, sometimes re relatively short short term schemes, um, where we can we can help people with uh, fuel poverty or. or, or or energy efficiency. So the Green Homes Grant is an interesting one. That runs until March 2022, where we've got uh, 722,000 uh, grant from government to retrofit properties. And we're retrofitting 95 properties with solid wall insulation uh, and, and, and solar panels. We, that includes private, pro private sector properties and, uh, and social housing. So we, we're working with Jigsaw on, on that, um, that's a, a scheme which works with the E.ON and the Nottingham uh, uh, Energy Partnership, which, as I say, is not not often uh, talked about a lot, but make, but makes a, can make a significant difference to individuals. In some of the some of the cases I I have where where I need to exercise discretion, you know, some people some people are in a very poor. Uh, health and very poor uh, poverty, and that little bit of money makes a big difference to their to their lives. Second area I, I thought you might be interested in would be the is the food hygiene and safety scheme. Um, all food food businesses, uh, well, no, there's some exempt food businesses, but those are not exempt are uh, required to uh, register and be inspected under the food hygiene scheme. And we've currently got uh, 779 businesses, of which 118 are exempt. Uh, and you can see of the 661 left, 95% uh, are four or five star rated. 89% um, are, are, are very good, which is uh, it's one of our performance indicators which shows a, a high level of, of, of standard in, in the food businesses in, uh, in, in Gedling. I've got a question from Councillor Creamer. It's just, I don't know if this, this scheme has changed over the years, but when it first started and you got all those, when it came up for renewal, you didn't have to remove your certificate, even if you didn't reach the standard you were at before. And there was nothing to make you remove a certificate, even if you weren't entitled to one. Has that changed? I remember, I remember having, we're having this, dis, having this discussion. Uh, I don't think you're allowed to show a, a, a certificate you haven't earned, but you're not required to show a certificate. So, so uh, if you, you, you'll see many businesses will have a certificate in their door, on their window, and they'll be the four or five star ones. 
the lower rated ones won't just won't display it. And it's a, it, I know it's a, uh, a concern for, for uh, environmental health officers and, and members generally, I suppose, that if you have the certificate, you ought to you ought to be required to display it. But that would require a change in change in the uh, in the government. It's just I was talking to a calf owner. <clears throat> I'm not saying where because <laughs> I don't know what state they're in it now. But they were a five, and they went down to a four, and they just kept the five certificate up. <laughs> yeah, do you want to make a comment, Kevin? Thank you. Um, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than it was previously. So I know that Scotland have gone for mandatory display of the correct certificate. Um, in England, they uh, made it voluntary. Uh, that that's really annoying because uh, I suppose the absence of a certificate is the absence of, of the business wanting to tell you what the food hygiene is like. So I suppose from a personal point of view, you need to be going into the fours and fives. Um, threes can be, you know, it depends on, on, on the structure of them, but there's, they're, they're not ideal. Um, you, you check, I suppose we would encourage people to check the date of the certificate. So if there were five, three years ago, in 2018 and they've since dropped down to three over the last previous years and it's still only a five in 2018 it would be an indication to members of the public that they probably want to be saying well what's the most recent one um it's been a bit to add to the confusion doing food hygiene inspections has, has fallen behind due to covid businesses have been closed um, not not being able to um, you know get, get get people out there safely to do it and you know, a lot of takeaways just weren't operating anyway some have closed down uh, but we are on track for the food standard agencies target to get I think we're about 200 behind which may sound like a lot but it's in line with other local authorities so we're encouraging people to take um, you know to stick us down and to do it um to, to make sure the are up to date uh, it does irk some of the environmental health officers and i've known them take stickers down when they've been leaving from previous years so we i suppose we are you know we are trying to, to to address it but i do get your point the thing i'd leave you with is check the check the score check the date <laughs> that was useful checking the date <laughs> councillor palin I just want to say that I think Natasha's law is having some really good effect in our uh, food and hygiene work and that uh, most places now do have lists of ingredients, which I'm very grateful for, for my grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's, that's an area that the, uh, the food hygiene team have been working with businesses to make sure they understand the, uh, the the regulations that's a big part of their of their work um, in in terms of advising you know as well as registering advising and, and supporting supporting businesses and uh, as Kevin said because with a lot of businesses not doing anything in in um, during co during the lockdown and now they're they're reopening and new business some businesses have closed and quite a few new businesses are are, are starting yeah, so it's a busy time for them. And of course, they they were they were busy. The the, the team was busy during the um, during lockdown, um, making sure that uh, businesses understood the regulations and were and were complying with them. You asked about safeguarding. It's not moved on. Oh, there we go. There it is. There it is. Yep. Yeah, you asked about you asked about safeguarding. And I thought about this in, in two ways. There's one, there's, uh, there's our functions as a council. So uh, those of you on E&L will be aware that taxi licensing uh, standards are being revised and that we're currently in the middle of, of consultation. Uh, Marge and I were, up, were on a, a, an LGA uh, webinar last, last week and the emphasis on the new standards is very much on Safeguarding. I mean, safeguarding's always been there, but this is this is really being been emphasised now. Um, they've been reviewed as a consequence of things like the uh, problems they had in Rotherham, um, but uh, it's it's very much uh, increasingly emphasised that the council must satisfy itself that drivers are fit and, and proper people and should not give them the benefit benefit of the of the doubt. Antisocial behaviour, when you, when you see some of the antisocial behaviour uh, 
cases. Uh, it's, too, it's too easy to think of victims and perpetrators. Uh, quite often, the victims are vulnerable, but equally the perpetrators may be, may be vulnerable. And a particular person, and I, I can think of a particular case in Arnold, um, the person, the perpetrator, is both a victim and, and a vulnerable perpetrator. So this is, this is an area where safeguarding comes in. I mentioned earlier on the, uh, the complex needs panel, and that's the sort of thing that they would um, get involved in. Um, and crime. I mean, again, young people, um, we, all, we tend to think of young people uh, involved in organised crime groups as perpetrators. But with, through modern slavery and county lines, they, they are victims themselves, and, and safeguarding is very much an issue, issue for them. Uh, so that's our, one of our functions. The, the other uh, area I was thinking was, uh, was casework, where you may get uh, reports of older people um, being, being uh, abused or taken advantage of, of children with the difficulties. Vulnerable adults, I mean, we were talking to one of our members recently uh, about uh, uh, a caravan on, on a drive near them, um, and neighbours were complaining that people were living in the, in the caravan. So they were complaining about the, the fact it was uh, affecting the, the quality of the neighbourhood, but to, to, to the member involved, immediately started bells ringing about the possibility of, of modern, modern slavery. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's quite a lot of safeguarding, and I suppose I'd, I'd want to... The question you asked was what training is, 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 is available. Mm -hmm. um, I, must admit, I, I did think we'd done some training last time, but Alec tells me we, uh, we didn't do any training last time. So I sort of yes. push, it back, push it back to you. What, what training do you think uh, is needed? Before we answer that, can we answer... Uh, Councillor Elwood's got a question. Thanks, Chair. That's, that's good. Um, yeah, just... Uh, well, more for information, really, because I had a, had some casework um, with regard to a possible issue in a, a care home, and um, I did raise it at the borough. And my understanding was those sort of issues were dealt with by uh, um, the county, the, the, uh, the MASH team, multi-agency safeguarding hub is that what it stands for so my understanding was that the borough didn't have a lot of involvement in safeguarding issues for members of the public it was more maybe safeguarding within our organization but outside of that there wasn't a great deal that we we, we were sort of involved in thank you no the, the the law is quite clear that everybody's got safeguarding responsibility and if anybody everybody comes up finds out anything, comes across anything, they need to do something something with it. And my answer was always, when we've talked about this in, in the past, when that sort of thing, is give it to David Jane. He, know, he knows about uh, safeguarding and he will deal with any, any refers. He will pass them on to the MASH. And so so that it's, that's, it's, he's in, it's our in to things like the MASH was through David Jane, who, as some of you will know, unfortunately, fortunately for him, because he's now working with the, with the county, has left. So the message, the message at present is any safeguarding concerns that come up like that, it's uh, unfortunately go Kevin's way until, until, we, until we appoint a new uh, um, community safety officer. So anything, anything, like that, anything like that, if you get reports of uh, people being, being uh, uh, neglected or being exploited, then you have to do something with it. And the elected member, you can't just ignore it. Okay, um, Councillor Martin Smith, um, got your hand up. Yeah, I'm not quite sure, David, where the, where the question came from about training, but but I do recall in the past um, the discussion that a number of us in the room and on on the council are school governors, and we will you know we, we will undertake sort of statutory training in that role, um, and and that's to ensure that we don't put ourselves into into positions that we shouldn't find ourselves in, and make inappropriate comments, but also to, to spot signs. Um, but as councillors, we all do. We all meet um, residents. Um, I went to a youth club last night. Um, I think I was probably the oldest one there. Um, but uh, again, you have to be very careful, don't you? Um, particularly in this day and age, of what you can and can't do. Uh, and 
possibly the question may have related to, to some basic training for, uh, for us as councillors for when we, we go out and meet with the public, what we should and shouldn't be doing. Yeah, can I just echo that, what uh, Martin said? I think that's probably, that's certainly something I would um, be grateful for, not having any of these other roles like school governor or anything like that, but just a, just a sort of general what you should be looking out for. I mean, I think I know probably what I should be looking out for, but it would be nice to have some, like, um, official, some, you know, guidance on that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, I know, I know we've, we've, we've had safeguarding training in, in the past, and obviously you have safeguarding training with specific responsibilities. So ENL, you can't sit on ENL unless you've had appropriate, appropriate training. But if there's, if there's a general view that it would be, be helpful, I'm sure I'm looking Alex, Alex, Alex direction is the sort of thing we could we could organize and it's, this is something you're saying to do now not wait until the next induction period and it seems to be yeah yeah we'll we'll, we'll get something something organized then okay and that I think I think it was, it was everything I'd been been asked to cover and everything I wanted to to uh, to cover unless anybody's got anything yeah. that uh, we've not touched on it's been it's been really good david and really uh, really interesting uh, to hear about all what the uh, what the police have been up to the crime and everything and all the other areas you you cover too it's been really really interesting very insightful um for us all and as you said i think we've had some questions as we went along has anybody got anything else to add at this point no everything's quiet well, on that note, I'll thank you very much. And thank you very much to Kevin as well for coming along to talk to us with his knowledge of the CCTV and lots of other, and lots of other things too. He knows a lot, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm forever ringing him up and saying, what can we do about this? What can we do about this? Um, so, yeah. Oh, Sam. Sorry, really quick question, David. You mentioned the Green Homes Grant and the money from government. Who's responsible for where that goes, just so we can find out more on that? On our, uh, on, on our website, in terms of the, 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 the policies, um, it's... But it, it's, it's, it's the way these government schemes always work. You know, the government sets something up, and then six months later, oh, we're going to do something slightly different for the next, next six months. And it's really, that's, what, that's part of Sam's, Sam's job, to actually keep on top of, of the latest, latest thinking. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, that's great. And um, thanks, thanks very much for your time, David and Kevin. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to next business now which is, um, oh. yeah, oh, yeah, sorry, we're going to talk about the portfolio holder attendance for next time, which is health and housing. Um, Henry Wheeler will be coming to talk to us about his portfolio. So, um, obviously, it would be good if we got some specific um, things to ask him about, like as we did with David, we had some specific things we wanted him to talk to us about. So it would be great if you've got any particular issues for Henry. I don't know if you want to talk about that now or you want to um, send anything you've got to Alec. That was Jim. I was just saying it would probably be better to uh, send, send them in so he's, pre he's prepared. So... Rather than do it now and then asking the same questions again, perhaps. Just a suggestion. Yeah, sounds good. Anybody else got anything to add, Marge? I'll just say that uh, a lot of what I was thinking of um, are, are co is covered by rep these reports that we're going to look at in a minute. There's, there's a lot of information on housing needs in there and how we're progressing things. So I'm really pleased with that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so now I think we will move on. Is that okay, Alec? Yep. So we're going to move on to point five, which is um, we're going to talk about the Gedling plan and the quarter two performance report. And I think Alec's going to say one or two things about that. Yeah, so um, this is just reporting the council's performance as at the end of quarter two, and Mike Hill's 
sent his apologies, he's not able to be here, but this report went to Cabinet last week, so I'm just going to repeat a couple of the highlights that Mike would have pulled out. So, in starting with actions, um, in terms of the 96 actions active in our three-year Gedling plan, we've completed two actions, and the other 94 are either in progress or being planned to start next year, and we're not anticipating any problems with those actions being delivered at the end of the period. Um, so, in terms of performance indicators of 31 indicators, 15 are on target, two are slightly below target, and three have missed the target. Uh, there are two indicators for which we have no data this quarter, and nine indicators which are just for tracking the data at this point. Uh, the two missing indicators are for the waste service, and the data is provided by the County Council. As of today, we've still not received that information. Um, but um, just to reassure members at this point, quarter one's target was hit, so we're not worried about those um, targets not being met. So at paragraph 2.4, examples of um, positive performance were the removal of fly tipping, uh, the good processing times for new housing benefit claims, excellent uh, customer services, um, telephone call handling stats, um, good levels of empty homes being brought back, uh, major planning applications are being processed on time, and uh, as David alluded to in his presentation, the quality of food premises in the borough. Um, so, on to the not-so-good stuff. Um, COVID-19 still impacting council um, operations, which has led to us missing the targets in three areas. Um, it's referred to in paragraph 2.5, so it's time spent in temporary accommodation is the first one. Although this has significantly reduced from 28.4 weeks to 24.8 weeks, the team have been working hard to reduce the number of people in bed and breakfast, trying even further to improve this by buying and leasing additional properties. And we're nearing completion on four leased properties and three purchases. So hopefully that should have some impact going forward into quarter three. Uh, so the provision of new additional homes um, report sets out details of the various developments currently underway. And this should start having a positive impact um, on this target by the end of the financial year. And the percentage of business rates collected uh, so the collection rate at the end of quarter two was lower than expected, and this is largely due to debt recovery work being impacted, and it, the team are anticipating this being brought back up in the next quarter. Uh, so in terms of achievements, um, Appendix 1 goes into these in some detail, but the ones worthy of note were the Summer Events Programme, um, which was well attended, uh, throughout the sort of much busier summer than we had the previous one. Uh, the Netherfield Intensive Weeks of Action, uh, COVID-19 Memorial Woodland at Carton Hill Recreation Ground, the Calisic Area Playground um, came on stream, which is proving very popular, and uh, climate change, um, obviously still a priority for the council, but there has been positive progress on the Gedling Green Homes grant scheme. And I would say I'd be happy to answer any questions. I will try, but if there is anything I can't, I'll take that back and reply after the meeting. Thank you. Can I say, I think I, I'd got a couple of questions, actually. Um, we, I noticed about the, um, the litter and dog fouling penalty notices that they were going down? Is it because we're not able, we're not catching people or because the problem's going down? Um, do you know, I think this may have been discussed at Cabinet, actually. Um, I'm looking towards anyone that was at Cabinet, but there isn't anybody here. Um, as far as I'm concerned, from what the information that was given at Cabinet, this is being addressed, but I will get more information about this and perhaps we can bring it back to the next committee. So just to sort of emphasise, you're just concerned about the levels of fines that are being um, issued? Yes, I think so, because when, when I looked through, looked at the, um, 
you know, looked at looked at the data. Yeah, I think the levels were fa were falling. Um, we weren't having a very high level of, um, you know, charging people. But I'm I'm wondering it is probably that we're not we're not able to catch people rather than um, it's actually not as much of a problem. So, Councillor Boyle, did you have your hand up? No. Oh, okay. That's fine. Um, has anybody else got any questions about anything in the report? Rachel Ellis. Yes, just following up from your question, actually, Chair. Um, I can't remember whether or not the borough uses the DNA um, system in terms of, of, I know it's a pretty awful thing to do, but in terms of sampling dog poo uh, for DNA and seeing whether it could be matched up um, with the specific animal. Unfortunately, I have no knowledge of that, but I will try and find out for you for next time. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's going to be a nice, that's a nice job for somebody, isn't it? Um, okay, um, so that was it. And I, I was also very pleased to hear about the um, the temporary accommodation um, facilities. You know that we're we're increasing our what we're going to be able to draw on for temporary accommodation, which is uh, very good news because I think as far as certainly over the last couple of years, that's been a that's been an issue whilst I've been on this committee. Yeah. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, if everybody's happy with that. Is that okay, Alec? Yep, yep, everybody's happy with that. So now we're going to talk about the scrutiny work programme, um, which is item six on the agenda. Um, and I'm just going to refer to these papers just here. Okay, so actually at this meeting, we don't, we don't, we don't have any any follow up from previous meetings to go through. Um, I will just mention something about the waste policy, which we did work on over the summertime, and um, this hasn't yet gone to cabinet. Um, um, sorry, I've, if I feel look like I'm looking on my phone, it's just I've got some notes on there. I've got some notes where I wrote some notes on there. Um, it, we have due to a change in the um, change in personnel at the council. Um, this is going to be deferred until the new director is in place and can take it forward. Um, it's very unfortunate this has happened at this time, but I think sometimes these things happen, and I think that our group, the OVM Scrutiny Group, and the working group that worked on this did a very good piece of work, and um, it was it's very much appreciated by um, by the um, by the deputy leader who's who it's with currently, and. Um, it might mean that in, that we consider it along with the um, other legislation that's coming through, which I think we did touch on um, during the policy, policy discussions when we're talking about things like the food waste might have to come in, we might not be able to charge for the brown bins, etc. So, um, you know, that will be all things that do get considered. But obviously the waste policy is a very big thing and will be um, considered in due course by Cabinet. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the work program um, going forwards. We did have a few few ideas that I think had been floated, but um, oh, well, that's that's a very unfortunate term of words. Bearing in mind what I'm just going to say in a minute, <laughs> in that I think we are going to be we are going to. Um, it has been suggested that we do something around the um, issue around sewage being. Um, released into waterways um, over the probably a very quick review over the next few, over the next few months, well, next couple of months perhaps, just quickly getting somebody into um, you know either talk to us or provide a report just to see what does get you know released into the waters in Gedling and and that somebody is monitoring that and the you know for the health of our residents, Councillor Boyle. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think, uh, I think it's a, a good idea that we do look at this and in some detail as well because there, there's been quite a lot of concern generally from residents about this particular issue and I think 
our committee being proactive in this in this area and actually engaging with uh, Seven Trent and other and other stakeholders in this area would would indeed be the, the right thing to do. So I think we ought, we ought to be looking at that in the in the coming months. Councillor Creamer. Yeah, I was just going to go along with that. I think it would be an excellent idea, but uh, without putting in the whole scope of things, it would be used to fit, useful to find out what's been happening and what the challenges are for, for the future, etc. Because it looks like it's going to be an on, ongoing thing with water, with water levels rising in general anyway. And part of the uh, excuse for, do it, for uh, not cleaning it properly was to actually only in flood periods. Well, as they're likely to increase. <laughs> I think it's an apt time to actually look at it. You may have to involve the county again with, as the SUDS group as well, uh, uh, urban drainage. So it'll be quite wide, wide ranging, I would have thought. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, so yeah, I think that's definitely something we could um, take forward. Yeah. Just to say, this was something that was discussed at the cabinet meeting last week and the cabinet also asked for a report and some further information on it so perhaps we could use that report as a starting point for perhaps taking this forward with this group yep i'm happy with that will they be getting the, the report to their next meeting um, i will find out yeah because i think that will be december with it the next meeting so um yeah that will be great but potentially something we can um talk about in our january meeting if that's okay um, we'd also talked about something around um, health health care. Now, um, I don't know what you feel about this, but um, what what impact we could have on things around health care? Because a lot of this is not directly within our remit. Certainly not within the council rem the borough council remit around health care. So I'd just be interested to hear your ideas. What you think um, we should be doing? Marge? Uh, I, I'm not absolutely certain what we could do. I'm a member of my own practice, GP practices, patient participation group. Um, and we actually had, had our first meeting last week, uh, first meeting for more than two years. Well, I, I, I think I, I actually missed one in January 2020 um, when I was away. Um, they have recognised that they are really that they have really fallen be, below a standard that we would like to see of our GP practices, and um, I think that they they are putting things in place. But I think it could be just that we get that feedback, not just from that one practice, but from other practices, what their concerns are and their strategies for improvement, because there's a lot of concern within the community about getting a doctor's vi visit, especially, or uh, a real um, appointment, uh, because they're doing so much by triage and telephone calls. So I think that sort of thing might be useful. But whether there's any real answers that we could, mm. anything that we could actually effect, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's probably more the um, issue that I don't know that we could, you know, make it make any difference really, um, apart from getting information on what the various practices are doing and what they're going to do in the future. Yeah, what what do you think, Alec? But my um, sort of we discussed this in our pre meeting. I think with the limited resources that this council has to progress scrutiny um, I'm not sure of the impact you could have in terms of the massive underfunding of the GP service in but that's just my view and you know if members had something else okay I'm going to bring in council Martin Smith first because um, you spoke a minute ago Jim yeah go on Martin I, I agree with what Marge was saying you know that there's there's issues in practices all around all around the country, uh, but I think the one thing we can do as as ward members is actually to to dispel a lot of the myths that, that are out there that 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 doctors aren't seeing um, people face to face. They actually are, 
uh, and the triage system isn't generally uh, organised by the doctor's receptionist. It's actually run by, certainly in the practice that I've spoken to, the, when I've spoken to the practice manager, it's run, it's run by senior, senior GPs. Um, but, but the important thing is that we get that message out to people in whatever form we can, because we've heard, unfortunately, so many cases where people have delayed contacting doctors um, about serious conditions and, and that those conditions have escalated. So whilst it may not be a working party topic, um, it's certainly something we can, all, we can all do. And I'm sorry if I'm preaching to you because we all know this really, don't we? But um, I just try and do our bit to, to you know, I mean, I write, I write a newsletter article um, for Ravenshead and I, I put this in, in this month's edition. Uh, I'm sure you've all read it. I'm sure you read it averagely my page, but... Uh, um. Um, yeah, so I'll just come back on that and then I'll come to the other questions in a minute. Um, I think that's probably um, a good thing because I'm, I would say, I mean, so you say you've spoken to the practice manager, maybe that is something we could, we could, we could all do um, and then we'd have a whole raft of information, you know, amongst, amongst ourselves. Um, yeah. And it would not put so much pressure on the, um, you know, council officers to help us out. I'm going to bring in, I am going to bring Jim Croom back in. I said his hand up a minute ago, and then I'm going to come to Mike Hope in a minute. Okay? Yeah, it'll Jim. be very, very quick, because <clears throat> I've seen the doctor today. I've got another appointment. Got them. So they, those, they are there. You can actually see them when, when, when they're requir required to. But I was suggesting, we could actually li literally at the, at the moment, just put this on the back, bo back burner and ask if there's any suggestions Councillor Wheeler might have, because he's actually on the, uh, the, health, you know, the, the health scrutiny committee anyway, the county and the health and wellbeing board, etc. So he may have some suggestions, because the only thing I can think of perhaps that we would have any real influence is, is how they want us to work with them, what we need to do. So I'd actually suggest it's a good idea, but we'll perhaps wait till after, after Councillor Wheeler's and yeah. uh, seek his suggestions after, after he's been to this committee. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent idea, Jim. So that could be something we put on the list to ask Henry to help us, you know, to think how best we could, uh, you know, get to the bottom of what's happening. GP practice. I've, got, I've got lots of people now. I've got um, Mike Hope, Paul Feeney, Jennifer, Sam, Rachel. So <laughs> we'll go in that order, Mike. Oh, thank you very much. Um, one of the things that, that concerns me um, and, and it's obviously of concern in Calverton, and that's who I'm speaking on behalf of here, it is, is working out what the strategies are, and they do reflect on the borough. I mean, we've got somewhere in the region of 400 houses which are probably going to be online within the next couple of years. In fact, I've been in touch regularly with County Hall um, because I'm a governor at the Sir John Sherbrooke School. Um, and and I, I envisage that next year, the numbers at that school could increase by 60 pupils. And I'm trying to persuade County to tell me what they're going to do to cope with these numbers. And, and I'm not getting an answer. All I've been told, and I can give you the answer, it's easy to remember. Um, when we know anything, we will of course consult the the governing body, but it's getting close. And exactly the same thing applies to the health services in Galverton as well. We've got a lot of houses that's going to put a lot of people onto the books of our GP services. The, the question we're asking is, and it is county again, but it does reflect on us because we're the ones who give planning permission um, for, for these houses and we're the ones who write in section 106 money and whatever else um, and, and, and the fact of the matter is we don't know what is going to you know, nobody's saying when we start getting these extra patients and they will be a large number we will do the following nobody is saying that there is no move it's almost as if rather than being proactive and getting all the ducks in a line so that um, things can be done and things have been thought about ahead of the time, um, we'll wait and see. Um, and, and, and if we can't cope, well, we'll, we'll have to, to come up with a good idea then. 
And that is what is concerning people in Carverton. Now, I don't know if, if there's anything the borough can actually do about that, but it does seem to me that we're in a, a very difficult situation, and it, it, whether we like it or not, it does reflect on the borough. Thank you. I think maybe that's something else we can ask Henry about, actually. How does the, um, you know, how does the, the money that developers have to pay for these kind of things filter through? and um, particularly to uh, GPs, provision of GPs. Okay, next I've got Paul Feeney. Yeah, thank you, Chair. We've got to remember what scrutiny is here. We've got to scrutinise the decision makings of the council and all these things, maybe, you know, the sewerage and the education and the health service may be very uh, interesting, but actually there's not the decision making of the council. And really, if we're going to use scrutiny's resources, we should look into things as we have in the past, the waste and others. But there's all leisure centres, lots of other things, where we make a decision and the cabinet make the decision and the finance and everything. And that's really the role of the scrutiny. All these other things may be interesting, but they're not actually the role of scrutiny. You're right, Paul, but I think also scrutiny does have a role in scrutinising things that affect our residents as well. Yes, but it, it's... Yes, but it's actually taken over. It's the whole, you know, right. there, there's nothing. Yeah. You've got to come internal. The, the waste one is ideal. That was perfect. But there's, there's other, many other decision makings within the council that we should scrutinise and mm. look in to see, to advise the, the cabinet where, which way we think they should go forward. Yeah, we, we, we need but a, all, all a balance. All these things are very interesting, but really we can't actually do anything about it. So what, there's a lot of sewage coming out of Stoke Border. What can we actually do as a council? Write a letter saying we don't want as much. That's about as far as we can go. Yeah. And I think part of it is about reassuring our residents that we are on things that concern them and that we're looking into it. But I, get, I definitely get your point, Paul. Yes, of course. So next I've got Jennifer. Thank you, Chair. Um, actually, what I have to say, oddly enough, ties into um, what the last three people have said. <laughs> Uh, firstly, what uh, Paul was saying about trying to do something that is actually within our remit, but also looking at what Mike was saying, just a proposal, an audit, an audit specifically of what are our number of residents, what is our need for GPs, and actually speak to the GPs within Gedling and find out what kind of numbers they have available so that we can match that up. Yes, we do have housing being built. We know there are more people coming, but what is the present state so that we know what provision is required? It may very well be that we look at it and we say, oh, actually, everything is hunky-dory. It's all lovely. We have nothing to worry about. Or we might look at it and say, sweet, help us. We are already on the back foot. But until we do an audit, we don't know, and we can't actually go forward with that. And what... Uh, Paul was saying, uh, Paul, pardon me, uh, what Jim was saying, as far as some um, communications and working with Henry, it might be worth working alongside some of our partners with public health or with the CCG. We know that things like the closing of the Richard Harrod has had some knock-on effects with vaccination with, and the capacity of GPs. It would be good to perhaps speak with our GP practices and even the ICS and public health and say, what about some common messaging? What is it that we need to get out to the residents that will be beneficial to them from a public health perspective, from a well-being perspective? We are looking at the health of all of the residents of Gedling. So how do we alleviate their concerns, let them know what is available, that yes, we understand that you're having concerns about this, here is the best way to seek help. Here is the best way to go about it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, it's another in, yeah, um, interesting way of looking at it. Yes, good point. Um, I'm going to come to Sam Smith next. Thanks, Chair. Paul's absolutely spot on. So I'm hoping, uh, with Gedlinborough Council concentrating on what we, is in our remit, so I'm hoping he and others agree with what I'm about to say. Um, page 42 of the report we've just had that Mike Kilwood had delivered talks about temporary accommodation and um, 
that were above average and above our target. It then goes on to mention that that's due to a lack of four to five bedroom houses. Then when you turn to page 49, it says what we're doing about it. But what we're doing about it is building two to three bedroom houses, even though two pages ago we said four to five bedrooms the problem. So annual cost is about £200,000 to the council. So can overview and scrutiny do something about looking at what more we can do to support bringing the weight down in temporary accommodation and bringing that cost down a bit? I think, um, I think that specific question can be asked about these particular um, reports. You forgot that, Alec? Yeah. It's yeah. In that's in Henry's portfolio. Oh, that's in Henry's portfolio as well, so we can bring it up with Henry. But I think it's not actually that long ago since we did more in-depth work on the, on the temporary accommodation um, situation. And I think it is just a, a, a really you know, difficult, difficult situation, um, yeah, that, that, we, that we find ourselves in. Um, yeah, then, but I think um, if we can ask Henry to, or, or, you know, for the next meeting to cover why that, what that discrepancy is about, yeah. Okay, so um, Rachel Ellis. Thank you, Chair. Um, going back to health, but um, sort of, landing squarely within the remit of the borough. Uh, I'm particularly interested in um, the mental health impact of COVID, which is still ongoing, let us not forget, of people who are feeling quite isolated. We may no longer be in lockdown, but people may be self-imposing restrictions. Um, I've always been quite interested in the whole idea of social prescribing. And social prescribing is something which the borough has supported and promoted. I would like to know where we were before COVID struck, uh, what has happened during COVID, uh, and what plans and ideas might be uh, available um, whether from other people or indeed from our own uh, group to breathe new life into social prescribing and into supporting and promoting local groups uh, that support um, vulnerable and isolated people in our communities. Okay, that could be something that um, Henry could talk about as well. As we mean in terms of Henry talking about it as well. But I think we do see quite a bit of um, uh, things in the achievements and things like that of the various groups that are uh, that are happening, and a lot of them are coming back on stream after COVID, etc. If they've had a break, I've, I was reading that several of them have been meeting on Zoom and things like that during the lockdown but yeah definitely a good point to bring up with Henry next time um I think that was everyone that had the hand up so we probably need to do some do uh, bring this back to a point what we're actually going to do um do you think it's better that we discuss with Henry what we what we think we can what we think we can achieve I think probably the something around the audit of the um, GPs, what we've got and um, what we need and how, who well, I guess it's it's just a small, well it's not so much a question for us to investigate in depth about whose responsibility is it to make sure that they match up because I don't know, is it our responsibility, is it the borough's responsibility do people think to ensure that the number of GPs match the people that are coming in as Councillor Boyle. Um, I don't know whether it's our responsibility as such, but what it is our responsibility to do is to point out where these things are lacking because well-being is very very much within within our remit. That's what I would say about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think you're I think you're right. Yeah. Okay, so um we'll Um, yeah, so we'll discuss with Henry in at the January meeting. He, we've got some questions for him already to answer ahead of time. And out of that, out of that whole discussion, 
will be will be born what we're going to do over in relation to um health etc so um going back to councillor feeney there paul um did you have anything specific you wanted to um you wanted to look at in relation to council decision making etc no but i think we could consult with the workforce somehow and ask if there's anything they would want to do into the you know there's all the leisure centers we've never done and various different policies and procedures and that's really what scrutiny is all about mm -hmm. so we should ask other bodies that we've got control over yeah. where they would want us to spend resources or even extra resources or cutbacks or whatever within the remit of the council okay um next i've got councillor elwood uh, thanks liz yeah just looking at the um uh, work program that's on page 68 it refers to obviously the, the health care stuff which we've just talked about and then this procurement strategy and then potential working group on carbon reduction strategy and I notice lower down on the on the program it's sort of um, got a question mark after it on on the on the thing for march so i didn't know whether that was still something that we're looking at or whether that slipped um and i know that the the public consultation on the borough's um uh, carbon strategy is is now now live so i don't know whether we have to wait for that to happen before we scrutinize anything but just wanted to know where we are with that really yeah um i think we were going to um do that into into march time because the new the new person oh, the new member of staff um will be here yeah. right? I, th I think we sort of spoke about this last time um because there is um a climate change officer being recruited currently and to do that any earlier i think wouldn't really be very fruitful because we've got to give them a chance to sort of get settled in and then perhaps bring them and um, have a discussion there, just see where we go with it then. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah, I mean, that's fine if it's still on track, it's just the way it looked. Yeah, so the question mark was <laughs> because I didn't want to tie us down to a particular time frame, but okay. it's still yeah. very much on our forward plan to do okay. something. We'll take the question mark out. Um, Sam Smith. Thank you. Councillor Freen is spot on when he says about focusing on what's in our remit. I wondered if we could see, to help us decide what working groups we're going to have, I wonder if we could see the Have Your Say survey results. I don't know if they're in yet, Alec. Um, and then look, scrutinise them and what issues Gedlin's responsible for that the public don't rate us very high on, and then have working groups on that, improving that, those areas, maybe? Yeah, that, that is, we do try and encourage that sort of approach to scrutiny. Um, but from what I sort of, I do understand that the results are in and are being looked at, but they'd have to go to cabinet before they came here, really. Um, but yeah, that, that's certainly a good starting point to look at something for the future. Yeah. So do you think we would get those results? Do you think are they come in going to cabinet uh, in December? I'm not you aware don't know. of any time scales. Oh, okay. But we can add that on to the work program yeah. that we're interested in. And the then, next yeah. meeting after whenever. Yeah. So if it might be, say, March, maybe we might have to go to March for that, to have your say um, results to see what what comes out of that. Yeah. Yeah. They always have done in the past. Yeah. Yes. Was any... Uh, Michael Boyle, were you indicating? No? Okay. Is anybody else indicating Jim? Yeah, I was just going along with Councillor Phoenix as well about the staff. I was going to make a suggestion, I'm not quite sure how we go about it, about at the moment of staff retention, because I'm thinking particularly of lorry drivers, freight and all this, and uh, are we going to lose drivers? Is it going to affect our service? Are we going to lose other staff in the uh, in the service industry, like, like the Richard Herod? Will they go somewhere else? So it would be worth looking at, to some extent, what the uh, position is of we, <coughs> us in this current climate as we come out of COVID with staff shortages elsewhere, whether we will, what our future is likely to be. Are we going to have to struggle getting more staff? Are we going to be OK? That sort of thing. So not to actually push in any particular direction, just to actually see what our position is 
and likely to be. Yeah, I think that's a, a good idea. So, uh, Councillor Feeney, do you indicate Yeah, I just thought of something off the cuff. Obviously, we've got the issue coming up that this council has and every council in the country. And we've got to prepare our fleet to go electric. And we've got to prepare our waste freighters to go hydrogen or whatever. It should be a long term looking at something like that. So, that how, what we're going to do for the vehicles, where we're going to charge them up. How are we going to change our resources? Are we going to offer things in? That's a major issue, but it's made, it'll have huge financial uh, ratifications for the council. And it'll, it you know, it may seem eight years away, but it soon comes in, I can tell you. Okay. I think, could that be a, a question we pose, to, we pose to Cabinet? Yeah, I, th I think actually at last week's Cabinet meeting, if I remember correctly, this was actually spoken about. So... I think there's sort of two elements to the answer. So firstly, there is a lot of national work going on that we can't really act until we know the results of. There's been a recent consultation, I think we discovered when we were in the um, working group, didn't we? Um, but it is something that the management team are actively looking at. But I think it's too early for us to take any specific action. Um, but, but we have to plan. And I'm saying you've got to plan years in advance for these things it's not just the vehicles it's all the residents where are all the part where are all the charging points going to be the obvious place will be on our property yeah. but i think um maybe what alex suggesting is because there's been this consultation there's been nationwide consultation is it yeah, yeah, Na yeah. nationwide consultation um maybe who knows we don't know what maybe well, we would we would hope money will come from central government, hopefully, to help us with this. And I suppose we don't know till that point, do we? Well, they they can't just say you need to make all your fleet electric, and you're not, we're not giving you any money either. You know, so I can't see. Hopefully, that won't happen. Um, and we know they they have talked about investing a lot of money, haven't they? In the um, you know in that. So um, Sandra Barnes. Thank you very much. Can I just say, Peter did mention this last time when he did his portfolio report. He did say about... Um, sorry. Peter did say about this at his portfolio meeting when he came in for scrutiny. He did say about the vehicles being electric and about it would be difficult to afford um, half of them anyway. And half of them wouldn't be able to get up... Um, yeah, the big hills and everything. So he did mention this. Okay, but I think, I think like Alex said, maybe we're a little bit too far out to be looking at the actual nitty-gritty of it all because we don't know what's going to come, um, you know, what, what help we're going to get from the centre because at the moment things do seem insurmountable, almost, almost literally, as in the big hills are insurmountable. Um, so we'll see... I think maybe that's something to keep on the... Maybe we can put it on the bottom of the list as a thing to keep an eye on, and when we get closer, we will be monitoring what's going to happen, um, how, we're going to, how we're going to look at that. So now I want to kind of draw to a close what, we're, what we've been talking about and just to summarise where we're going to go um, going forward. So I've closed the paper. That's not helpful. Just a minute. Let me get back to where we were. So we're going to do. Um, we are we are going to do a thing on sewage. Cabinet have mentioned it, um, and that we are going to look at what's going on because that's to do with the health of our residents and our environmental. You know the environment in the borough, which I think we do need to keep an we do need to keep an eye on, and to try and you know find out what has been happening and what is going to happen, etc. Um, and then we're going to talk to Henry. Um, at the next meeting um, specifically about these other issues and we'll decide some sort of health strategy thing out of that. We've talked about a staff, we've talked about a staff survey to get some opinions from the staff of the council about, so you mean in like areas what, con what concerns them and things like that, is that what you were talking about? Who mentioned that, Paul? I, I did, but I mean, it's really brought and out us senior managers as well as unions, just what they would like us to 
look into and then whether they're accepted or rejected. I mean, there may have be good ideas that they've got, there may not be, but it's, it should be our, our role to ask them on an annual basis if there's anything that they would like us to look into. Okay. So you think that's potentially, potentially it might be useful to talk to, talk to Mike Hill about that? Have Mike Hill to talk to us? Is that possible, yeah, so do you think? We could put something about how we could engage staff and just see Sorry. how we, we go with that, really. I know that the, I know the resident survey we talked about, I know the, annuals, the biannual staff survey has recently been done, and perhaps we could do something with what's, what, what comes out of that. Oh, OK, yeah, so if there has been a survey done, that would be very useful. So if we could tie in, maybe Mike Hill coming to talk to us about that with when those results have you know, been decided have come out. Is that, do you have any idea when that might be? No, you don't know. Okay, so um, it will, that will appear on the schedule at some point then. Councillor Paley, Marge. Uh, page 69, we've got um, rolling issues of the procurement policy. Um, is that still part of what you, you're considering? Because I, I, I thought it was more a working group review of the procurement yeah, so, policy. Um, from what I understand, the procurement policy is being finalised at the moment, and we were the idea was to take it in as an item in a committee rather than do a in-depth review on it, um, and then perhaps if you know, once we look at it in committee, it is considered we need to do something more in depth. We can take it from there, but at the moment, it's just getting the policy done and before this committee really, and don't have a time scale for that. Okay. That's fine. Oh, sorry, thanks. Thanks for that, Alec. Um, so, are we, are we happy with where we are with the um, working groups, etc.? We do seem to be in a bit of a quiet time at the moment, but um, the um, sewage thing will take off. Um, I think that'll probably be the next thing to take off. Yes, I can see Councillor Hope. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, I just want to come back on the procurement policy thing. Are you saying that a policy is being developed, so we're going to wait until it's decided and then review it? Surely, surely, surely that is really ask about tit. Sorry for, for my French. Um, sh sh surely what we should do is see what is being proposed, look at it, and make recommendations so that the final policy is the bee's knees, to use yet another phrase. Yeah, I think my understanding, this isn't going to be a policy that's sort of one of the council's public policies. It's more of a, an internal one, but I don't know. Well, no, but in terms of what we're looking at internally is how we procure goods. I think it's sort of not at the point of being um, going to cabinet or anything like that. So I think the intention was once we have a working policy, which isn't necessarily the final one, it would come here to see if there's any um, input. That, that's my understanding of it, yeah. but I, I might be wrong. So I think you're saying, I think you're saying, Alec, is that there's not there's not really even a draft at the moment. Is that what you're saying? And so we're like way yeah. down the beginning yeah, it's of the one process. Of those things that, is being worked on, um, but there isn't really a date because there isn't a policy and we're still procuring goods. You know, it's not time critical, but it will come eventually, yeah. is, is my understanding. So can we have a, maybe can we have an, can we have an update for who, from whoever's doing that as yeah. to what state it's in at the moment and then if it's appropriate for us to have a look at it? Definitely. Yeah? So if we could do that in January, that would be lovely to have a update on that okay um yeah so we're going to have quite a lot to discuss in january by the sound of it lots of things to come back on henry will be here to uh, talk to us about his portfolio and answer these questions and hopefully help us to um craft a working group on um, some of those issues that are concerning our residents. We've also got a review of the risk register in January too. 
Okay. So I think I'm going to move on from that point now. So that was, that was everything on that, wasn't it? Yep. So any other items that I don't think there's anything else that's urgent at the moment, mention the sewage thing, that's probably the urgent thing at the moment. Um, we've talked about that already, though. Um, so I think that's it. So thank you all very much for attending uh, this evening and for your great uh, input and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.